Hello, everybody. Welcome to part 7D of the Magdalene Manuscript. I think I said this last week, but if I did or didn't, I might be saying this again. I'm actually enjoying this part of the Magdalene Manuscript more than I'm enjoying the channeled part of the Magdalene Manuscript. I applaud this channeler for pointing out that both Magdalene and Yahshua were raised in the priestess and priesthood of Isis and Osiris. They were not Jewish. However, as most of you know, I do not believe that Yahshua was crucified. Um, but with that being said, as I've said many times, a lot of times with these channelings, there is somewhat of a confirmation bias, especially when this book was written in the early 2000s, because that was the story that had been programmed into our heads. But as, I'm, as I was saying, I'm really enjoying this back part of the book better where the channeler is actually writing about specific topics in spirituality and especially within spiritual alchemy now last week we spoke a lot about the chakra system i will be placing the playlist for this series down in the description box below in case you have missed the other parts of this series however today we're going to be starting with page 127 in my book i don't know if that's the same in your book but again for my book this is page 127 and this is raising the jed and the myth of horus through the power of intention or will, the alchemist eventually causes Shechem to move up the spine. So again, Shechem is life force, like prana or chi. And the spine, as we spoke about last week, in his lineage is called Jed. In my lineage of yoga, it's called Shashumna, which is again a pathway that runs up the spine. And once again, this is energetic body, guys. This is not physical body. Just again, a reminder, you're, you're not going to see your Shashumna on a... Um, MRI, right? Or an x-ray. This is all energetic body. So the alchemist eventually causes Shechem to move up the spine and into the head centers, creating over time the uraeus. As electromagnetic force of Shechem moves upward through the chakras or seals, these centers are stimulated. The rising of Shechem up the jet is called the rising of the jet, as I mentioned earlier. As the seven main seals or chakras are activated through this process, the consciousness of the alchemist is radically transformed, correct? Symbolically, this movement of consciousness is mirrored in the story of Horus. There are two views of Horus. The first view holds Horus as an actual physical being who lived at the dawn of Egyptian history. The second view does not supplant the first view, but is more symbolic in nature. Whether Horus physically existed, we cannot say for sure. Legends and stories abound, as do the theories regarding the origins of his mother Isis and his father Osiris. Some view these figures as aliens from another world, starseeds, if you will. In this view, Isis and Osiris were geneticists, and we are the descendants of this ancient science. Some starseed theorists have even related these figures to the early Sumerians. The most common view, and one that is generally accepted by academic Egyptologists, is that Isis and Osiris were divinities that existed within the living mythos of the time. They were, to use a Jungian term, archetype realities within the collective unconsciousness of the ancient Egyptians. I, Even though I consider myself to be a bit of an academic because I love to learn and I love to research, and I, I gather, I mean, I, I feel like I'm pretty, pretty smart. I'm a pretty intelligent person, but I'm not a fan of the whole academic world. I think the academic world is just another name for indoctrination. And even though I myself do have a high level of education, I do consider myself to be a, a separated now from that academic world, simply because of this great awakening and the fact that I never, I guess, I never, you never, if you're watching, lost that ability to critically think or lost your common sense within the indoctrination process. And um, my, my views on Isis and Osiris is that, yes, they were starseeds, but so are we. If you're awake right now, most likely you're a starseed too. And I think they actually did live. I think they really, truly lived. I don't think they were mythical creatures or specifically like aliens or off-worlders as we would see them. You know, if they were starseeds that decided to incarnate into a human body, well, that's exactly what most of us have done too. We're human beings in this life, even though our soul might generate somewhere else. All right. From a purely practical standpoint in regards to alchemical practice, it does not matter if Horus is physically existed or not. The story holds alchemical keys, which if understood, open up a wealth of understanding. Horus is depicted as a hawk-headed man. 
As the son of Isis and Osiris, he symbolically represents the fusion of spirit and matter, which is basically all human beings, right? That's, again, as I've said before, in the yoga practice, we talk about this idea of opposing forces a lot. And we see this primarily in the asana practice with the gross body, where in different asanas or postures, you're holding it, you're, hold, you're strengthening as well as opening. And that's an opposing force. But human existence is also that in itself. For example, you are a immortal being that's living in a mortal body. Talk about causing some friction with that opposing force, right? Okay, so the combination of spirit and matter, which is what that is. In many ancient cultures, the feminine principle, our mother, was viewed as matter. Interestingly enough, our world matter derives from the Latin world word matter, which means mother. In these early centuries, the male principle father was viewed as spirit. Thus, at the symbolic level, Horus is the result of joining together spirit and matter. Horus's journey to the high god Horus is allegorical to our own journey up the jet. In one form of the story, Horus must overcome evil by killing his uncle Set, who murdered his father. The myth is very complex and has many versions, but for our purpose here, we will focus on one stage of the battle, the moment when Horus becomes the god Nin. So the next section is the god Nin. In order to overcome Set, Horus must accumulate vast amounts of energy. At the alchemically symbolic level, the alchemist must rise above the lower three chakras and take his energy, a tremendous amount of energy. As anyone who has ever tried to rise above their own conditioning knows, the power of inertia is very strong. Inertia is the force that keeps things from moving. Psychologically, it shows up as lethargy, a reluctance to make the efforts to require a, to change a situation or evolve. We have that a lot within the spiritual world. People, in theory, they want to change, but in action, they don't. All right. Whether one is trying to stop a bad habit or activate the higher powers of consciousness does not matter. Inertia and lethargy becomes one's nemesis. To overcome this limiting factor in our psychological makeup requires a level of energy stronger than the force of inertia itself. This energy is in the form of shakam or that which makes, makes things erect. In other words, Horus is, harnesses his procreative powers. This symbolized by the god Men, who is shown with a large erection while holding a flail in one hand. The flail is often a piece of wood with other strips tied to one another, and it is used to discipline a horse, especially when riding a chariot. Don't hit your horses. The flail of men is never actually used. It's a sim symbol of intent or purpose. This may be an unfortunate symbol for the modern mind since the flail carries intimidations of self-abuse or harm. Nothing could be further from the intent of this symbol. A charioteer managing a spirited horse needs to direct its attention in the direction desired. If he or she does not direct the steed, the horse will take off on its own. This can be both wasteful and dangerous. The flail allows a charioteer to get the horse's attention by whacking it on the rump. Now, a sensitive equestrian knows that he or she does not need to hit the horse hard to get its attention. If rapport has been established between the horse and the man or woman, a slight movement of the flail is all that is needed. Thus, the flail, in a sense, is symbolic reminder to harness the procreative energies of sex. And that is true. Like that's, I think a lot of people, again, really, really misunderstand meditation. Meditation is not about visualizing and letting your mind create fantasies. Meditation is about a one-pointed focus. Yoga to Vritti Narodaha. It's about getting the mind to a one-pointed focus. That's why with a lot of traditional meditations, there's mantras because it keeps the mind focused. Because where the mind is focused, that's where the energy is going to go. Instead of sending his seed out into the world through the sexual act, Horus, as the god men, harnesses this energy and sends it up the jet. As the energy makes its ascent into the higher brain centers, Horus is transformed by the power of the Uraeus into the high god Horus. He is no longer a god in potential. He has become a creator god in his own right. Then and only then is he able to defeat Set. This depiction to, that, to, this depiction to set things straight is not a call to celibacy. The holding of the god men's seed is symbolic and refers to the holding and the transformation of subtle forces within the sexual fluids. 
It is these subtle forces that are cultivated and sent of the Jed, whether male or female. And they did speak about, Mary did speak about that in the Magdalene manuscript. And I do know that that is a part of tantric, uh, say yoga or, you know, tantric sex is not actually having an ace of cups moment, if you know what I mean, but pulling it back in. So anyway. In actuality, there is no need to refrain from sex act in order to practice this form of alchemy. Indeed, as the Magdalene discusses in the manuscript, there are ways that a sex act can greatly empower the ascent of the shakem up the spine. For various historical reasons, too complex to go into here, the church separated sex from the spirit. But in ancient Egyptian understanding, they were intimately connected. And yes, we learned that with Isis, that the original sin was the separation of sex from the wholeness of the human um and i know i grew up in the 80s and 90s where like purity culture was a big thing and we've spoken about this with emmy and stephanie and i'm not not a fan of purity culture i think that that is so toxic and it does so much psychological damage especially to girls however i am also someone who practices brahmacharya where I, I it's appropriate use of energy i don't sleep with any just anyone there has to be um, an emotional connection there and a commitment there. There has to be a monogamous commitment there too. So, um, so yeah, finding that happy medium between going all out and also restraining yourself. So anyway, all right. So the next section is called misunderstandings regarding the God men in the middle ages. The flail was adopted by overzealous monks in attempts to purge themselves of sin. The essential teaching behind the flail and the God men had been lost. Instead of being viewed as a symbol for the attainment of godlike powers, the flail was used to inflict self-torture in sadomasochistic rituals of flagellation. Yeah, that's shit. They do that in the Catholic Church. is so fucking weird to me, like, that they beat themselves. Like, it's so weird. Mendicants would sit in their cells and lash themselves with flails to atone for their imagined sin. Perhaps they entered altered states of mind as a result of exhaustion and blood loss, but these macabre rituals had nothing to do with the alchemy or the secrets of the great god men. But foolishness in regards to men was not confined to the Middle Ages. At the turn of the last century, there were tremendous interests among the Victorians in the lost secrets of Egypt. Egyptology was at its infancy, and many an adventurer trekked off for the desert to discover the secrets of the Golden Age. To their horror, these stiff, Anal retentives discovered large statues of men all over the place, and every one of them had a big you know what. I guess men, since the beginning of time, has have always been comparing penis sizes. I, listen, if it's too big. Anyway. So di so distressed by these discoveries were they were, so distressed by these discover discoveries were they some of the more shocked zealots cut off the often offending organs and relief of men and reliefs of men taken off to museums were i am told often mutilated at the very least a plaque at the very least, a judiciously placed plaque would serve to hide the offending member from their more civilized countrymen. The Victorians had missed the point, as had their predecessors in the Dark Ages. The ancient Egyptians were not glorifying sex. They were acknowledging it as a sacred act. It had its place, not just in the bedroom or in the bordellos and whorehouses, but in the temples at the very center of their quest for the divine. Next section is called immortality. But before we get into that, I just want to note that I hope you guys can see where the dark controllers have manipulated a lot, a lot of this. I hope that that's clear for you guys watching right now. Immortality. Ultimately, the goal of Egyptian alchemy is immortality, or at the very least, an extension of the self after death. In this regard, there are two means available to the alchemist, one of them temporary and the other permanent. In the first method, the energy building practices are pursued until the call is virtually scintillating with energy and light. When death of the physical body ensues, the alchemist shifts his or her attention into the ka. Much previous experiences in the shifting of identification ensure that this process is accomplished with little effort. 
With the senses of self fully in the Ka, the alchemist now on an energy being is unaffected by the death of the physical body. To him or her, it is like taking off an old suit of clothes. The duration of the alchemist's existence as an energy being depends upon how much energy was collected while alive. If the alchemist has learned to collect and conserve energy as an energy being, then the length of the existence could be quite long. For whatever it's worth, I have met energy beings who claim to be thousands of years old. I believe that. And I think that, that most of us are, are on the dawn of a new day we, where we are going to be understanding how to prolong our, our lives as our ancestors did. In the second method, the energy building practices are pursued just as it just as in the first way, since charging of the Ka is vital to both methods. However, there are significant differences. In the second path to immortality, the alchemist must align himself or herself with his or her celestial soul, the Ba. The aspects of self is transcendent outside of space and time. Some might refer to it as the soul or high self, but whatever one calls it, there is alignment that must take place with the Ba, the celestial soul, and the Ka through the Jet or sacred pathway of the chakras. When this pathway is aligned with the Ba, there is a great influx of spiritual energy into the Ka body. When this reaches a critical mass, the Ka ignites, as it were, with the etheric fire. This is sometimes called the golden remnant. But what was referred to by the ancient Egyptians as the Shahu, the body is immortal. Just how an alignment with the Ba or celestial soul creates such a metamorphosis of the Ka is a closely guarded secret. It involves the highest aspects of alchemy and is revealed to the initiate when he or she is ready. That's super important. Um, that's one thing, again, I've mentioned many times I find in this great awakening, the people that are just now discovering like the spiritual world, it's kind of like this shit show right now because people are trying to race to the end. And if you saw our, our last episode that I did with um, Stephanie and Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa over the Ankh, we, you don't want for Kundalini just to all of a sudden happen um, is not necessarily a good thing. It's traumatic. It needs to happen over a long process process of time you can't just start at the beginning and leapfrog all the way to the end that's not how this works you have to go from a to z you have to take the steps to get there and a lot of people i feel like that are just finding spirituality they're getting caught in this sense of delusion because they want to jump to the end and they're not doing the work to help center them before jumping to that end if that makes sense so he's completely right about that there are some teachings that are withheld from the public because they're only granted to a student when that student is actually ready for them because if, if the student takes the teaching before the student is ready it can cause a lot of harm not just to the, to the student but to everyone around the student as well all right this re revelation may come directly from an embodied teacher but more often it comes from the akul one who has attained the life body and who now lives in the realm of spirit. Sometimes this information is revealed directly from the Ba to the alchemist. In regards to survival after death, I should point out that many spiritual tr traditions say that there is a spark of consciousness that always survives death, regardless of the level of, att of attainment. However, this spark does not hold the sense of personal identity in the way of the Ka or the Sahu. Thus, a death at one's personal sense of self, as well as the memory of a personal history dissolves unless one of these subtle bodies has been stabilized next section is called the ent in addition to energy building practices for the attainment of immortality that's a who there must be a moral or ethical edit attitude towards one's life one must learn the right use of energy and how to conduct oneself in relations to others yeah so this gets into yoga with the yamas and niyamas that uh, Patanjali speaks about where brahmacharya comes from that, that i said i practice brahmacharya appropriate use of energy as far as sexual energy is in the uh niyamas of the yamas so and that's kind of what i feel like he's going with here there has to be a lot of integrity when you're um learning these d these deeply complex layers of your overall being you have to really really come from a place of integrity all right, so one must learn the right use of energy and how to conduct oneself in relation to others. There is a real danger in the attainment of powers brought about through the practice of Egyptian alchemy. As I said with the Yoga Siddhis, when he was talking about the Siddhis that are presented in the third and fourth pada of the Yoga Sutras, 
we don't even really talk about those with students unless they've been like consistently a student for 10 to 20 years. I mean, that's why, because there, there could be danger if the person isn't ready to take on the cities in a responsible manner. As one's consciousness becomes stronger, so does the ability to create manifestations of one's intentions. If an alchemist purposely harms others in the course of his or her actions, he or she is in the danger of being devoured. The sacred texts warn the alchemists of this dangerous passage through a very strange creature called the Amet, part crocodile, part lion, part hippopotamus. The Amet is usually shown with a representation of the Jed, that depiction of the seven chakras are shields in ascending order and sits with its reptilian snout resting ominously between the third and fourth chakra, the solar plexus and the heart. This position symbolically refers to the place between power and love. Yes. So your third chakra is right there in your solar plexus, right where your ribs meet. And the fourth is like right here. So right in that sternum area. So if you're a woman, right at the bottom of your bra line and right there in your sternum. So like kind of between your, your boobs, that's where the two chakras are. So he's talking about this place right in between that balance between power and love. The event is oftentimes referred to as the great devourer since those persons stuck in these lower three chakras will be devoured by their experiences. For instance, persons centered only in the first chakra will seek security above anything else. Those centered in the second seal will be obsessed with sex, and those in the third will be driven for power. If a person remains motivated solely by these energies without moving upwards along the jet, he or she will eventually be consumed by them. But what I'm noticing is that people are spending too much time up here and not enough time down there there has to be a descent to Muladhara, which is the base chakra. You have to heal that. If you're constantly seeking security, that means that your Muladhara is not balanced. A healthy, balanced Muladhara is acceptance that security will always be there. If you're obsessed with sex, then that means there's something, or, or if sex is no interest to you at all, that means that there is either an overactive second chakra or an underactive, and you have to have that healthy balance. Third is money, plura, power. If you're obsessed with controlling other people, then there is an, an overactive money, plura. But if you give away your power too easily, then there's an underactive money, plura. And so you have to find the integral part of the first three chakras to know the faith of your own security, to be balanced with sex and to own your own power without dominating other people, if that makes sense. All right. Persons engaged in the practice of alchemy can fall victims to their own misguided lusts for sex, security, sex, and power. This is seduction can be very strong since the practice of alchemy builds the magnetics of the call and desires are more quickly attained. It is important to understand this clearly. The practices of Egyptian alchemy build the magnetic fields of this practitioner. By magnetic, I do not mean the forces of magnetics as in physics, though there is some relationship. Rather, I mean a, a psychodynamic force that is magnet-like in, in these properties. Persons with strong psychomagnetic fields tend to draw themselves the objects of their desires more easily than those in weak psychomagnetic fields. Because the cob building practices greatly increase the psychomagnetic forces of the practitioner, he or she must be careful. And I've spoken about this before. I think it was with the Sophia Code where we talked about manifestation versus Dharma. And I personally do not like the word manifestation um, because I know manifestation is also used with black magic. So you have a Dharma. All right. So you have things that are already in your soul contract. You already have a divine inheritance. And so when you open yourself up to receiving what you're opening yourself up to receive is your own inheritance. If you're trying to manifest something that doesn't belong to you, that is not in your soul contract, then that is black magic because you are taking from someone else. Okay. So that's what he's talking about here. If you get so honed in on your psychic abilities that you're able just to take whatever you want, then you've crossed the line into service to self versus service to others. For example, when my natal chart was being used and you guys have all commented about the way I looked at December. Yes. I look back at videos from December. I was definitely on death's doorstep. Um, my life force was being manifested by someone else through the essence of my soul chart. So what was that doing? It was giving that person ammunition to spell cast using my life force, my essence, but it was taking away from me, right? It was pulling my, what was mine. 
Okay. So that person was manifesting my life force, right? And I had to take it back. Okay. It wasn't that person's dharma. Now, when you do that, when you manifest things that aren't yours through your own free will, then there is a karma to pay for that. There is going to be a repercussions for those actions, but you always have to remind yourself of that and not become so obsessive about trying to create things in your life because you have to remember that you have a dharma. You have something that's rightfully yours. And then you have things that are rightfully belong to other people. And so you have to be accepting of that. When you're able to accept the idea of Dharma, then you can control your psychic abilities in a very healthy way without infringing them on other people's lives and free will. It is important to understand this clearly. The practice of Egyptian alchemy builds a magnetic field to the practitioner. By the magnets, I do not mean the forces of magnetism and physics, though there is some relationship. Rather, I mean the psychodynamic forces that is magnet-like in its properties. The Amet stands as a reminder of the passage from the lower three seals chakra into the heart. Those persons insisting on experiencing life in the lower chakras without passing into love will eventually be devoured by their desires in the lower three realms, the quest for security, sex, and power. When someone passes through the initiatory gate of the fourth seal or chakra, he or she will experience spontaneous seeing a rising of agape, unconditional divine love. So the fourth chakra again is Anahata. And yes, Anahata is rooted in divine love of understanding what that source love really is. But make no mistake, make no mistake. Anahata can also be negatively aspected. People with broken hearts or um, have fucked up lower chakra systems can manipulate people through love. Uh, people who don't necessarily manipulate but had a broken heart tend to, to walk like this. You know, we've talked before about the hands, the chakras and the hands are an extension of the heart. And if you have a violent heart, you use your hands for violence. If you have a loving heart, you use your hands for love. So make no mistake, the fourth chakra, the Anahata can also be really screwed up too. All right. When one experiences the world from this place in consciousness, it is not possible to knowingly harm another person. Agape is all inclusive. By nature, it generates feelings of connectedness because the ego sense of the self is expanded to include others. Harming another person would be unthinkable. But this sense of harmlessness is only present at the level of the heart. Persons coming solely from the lower three centers can easy, easily manipulate and harm others in order to get their own selfish desires met. The emet stands as a sobering reminder to those on the alchemical path. Those who insist upon living their lives without love will be devoured by their desires. As if the scary prospect of being devoured by the Amet is not enough to temper the desires of the alchemist, there is another figure. This one stands on the other side of death. And also like, for example, narcissists, love bombing. Love bombing is a sign of a, a, of a wicked heart. So just be aware of that, that Anahata is not fully positive. There are negative aspects to it. So the Met. Met is an important deity in the Egyptian pantheon having to do with the dead. Met is often depicted with a scale. On one side is the heart of the person seeking entrance into the boat of heaven. On the other side is the scale of a feather. The dead person's heart is as light as a feather. He or she is given entrance into the spiritual paradise. If, however, the heart is weighed by regret, guilt, shame, the person is not given entrance and must wander through the underworld. Symbolically, I think the figure of Met is, as a friend of mine says, a call to presence, a reminder that what we do in this life will follow us into the next. So now we come to final thoughts of this section. The ancient Egyptian mentality is so far from our own, it's difficult to imagine what they really thought and felt. We have fragments of writing, a few sacred texts, and the myth of their gods and goddesses. Fortunately, we have also inherited some of their alchemical secrets, but much of that glorified civilization is lost to us. The chasm in time is too large. By the time Magdalene had trained in the temples of Isis, Egypt had fallen. Its golden age, a long lost glimmer. But enough of the ancient alchemical knowledge had survived along with an understanding of how to use it. By the last century BC, the Isis cult and the secrets of sexual alchemy had spread throughout much of the ancient world. Undoubtedly, as with all things, each culture introduces its own understandings and interpretations into the Isis mythos. 
over time. Churches were built upon the ruins of temples, and the spiritual practices of that earliest time were often modified or forgotten or inverted by the dark cult. But anyone seriously looking beneath the surface of this alchemical tradition of the world can often find the mark of Isis in the alchemy of ancient Egypt. We stand now 2,000 years more distant than, than did the Magdalene from the alchemist of that ancient time. I don't believe that. I think we're much closer to Magdalene's time. As you guys know, when we understand Tartaria, we understand that we are a lot closer to Magdalene and Yahshua's time than the controllers have let us believe. For those of us working with the alchemical system, this task is clear. We cannot really relive the past. For one thing, we can never truly know it. We must learn what we can from the fragments that have been left behind. We must practice the al ancient alchemy of transformation as we understand it to see where it will take us. And we must forge a new alchemical way for this time. May the Akul, the ancient ones who obtained the Saku, help us in our quest. May the light of illumination guide us through our own darkness.